Chapter 2 Settlements From the year 876 the Danes became colonists and settlers. Raid and plunder gave place to peaceful pursuits. The English Chronicle says that in this year Halfdina portioned the lands of Northumbria and they henceforth continued ploughing and tilling them. This colonization of Deira by the Danes was soon followed in other districts. The greater part of central Britain with the whole of the north and east came entirely under Scandinavian rule. In 877 trading is recorded by the sagas from Norway, in a shipload of furs, hides, tallow and dried fish, which were exchanged for wheat, honey wine and cloth. Thus early was established the increase in comfort and wealth, as evidenced by the erection of Christian monuments early in the 10th century. The origin of long wait and long hundred count is traceable to the Danish settlements. This peculiar reckoning survives in the selling of cheese 120 pounds to the CWT, and in the counting of eggs. 120 to the hundred. The timber trade counts 120 deals to the hundred. On the east coast fish are counted 132 to the hundred. Six score to the hundred is still popular in Westmoreland measure of crops and timber. This Danish method of count was derived from the Icelandic term hundred which meant 120. Professor Maitland, in his Doomsday Book and Beyond says that the number of soakmen or free men, owing certain dues to the hundred court, or to a lord, who were masters of their own land, like the customary tenants of Cumberland, was greater in Norfolk and Suffolk than in Essex, and that in Lincolnshire they formed nearly half the rural population. At the time of Doomsday the number of serfs was greatest in the west of England, but none are recorded in Yorkshire and Lincolnshire. In the manners bearing English names the Soakman numbered two-fifths of the population, while in those manners with Danish names they form three-fifths of the population. Boyle. In the Dane law they represent the original freeholders of the settlement and owed obedience to the local thing or trithing court. In those districts which were not conquered by Edward the Elder the freeholders settled and prospered and with the spread of Christianity they became independent proprietors and traders. The presence of Danish place names marks the district which they conquered, including the counties of Lincoln, Nottingham, Derby, Leicester, Rutland, and Northampton. In the rest of Mercia few of these names are to be found, viz, in Cheshire, Shropshire, Staffordshire, Worcester, Gloucester, Hereford and Oxfordshire. The eastern part of the Danish district came to be known as the Five Bergs, namely, Derby, Leicester, Lincoln, Stamford and Nottingham. From the year 880 when Halfdan divided the lands of Dera among his followers the conditions of life became those of colonists, and the Danes settled down to cultivate their own lands, learning the language of the earlier Angles, teaching them many words, and ways of northern handicraft, and gradually intermarrying and forming the vigorous character of body and mind which denotes the modern Englishman. From the middle of the 10th century men bearing Anglo-Danish names held high positions in the church. Odo was Archbishop of Canterbury, his nephew Oswald was Bishop of Worcester and afterwards Archbishop of York in succession to Oskytel, and many Norse names appear as witnesses to royal charters. The hatred still existed against these barbarous Danes, and it is recorded in the Saxon Chronicle that the Saxons learned drunkenness from the Danes, a vice from which before they were free. This character is strangely contrasted by the story of John of Wallingford that they were wont, after the fashion of their country, to comb their hair every day, to bathe every Saturday, lagerdag, bath day, and to change their garments often, and to set off their persons by many such frivolous devices, and in this manner laid siege to the virtue of their women. If we are to accept the evidence of Lord Coke, we are indebted to the Danish invasion for our propensity to make ale the national beverage. This eminent authority says that King Edgar, in permitting the Danes to inhabit England, 
first brought excessive drinking among us. The word ale came into the English language through the Danish all, at any rate after the advent of the Norsemen, the English left off drinking water and began to drink ale as the regular everyday beverage of the people. The term beer was used by the Anglo-Saxons, but seems to have fallen into desuetude until the name was revived to distinguish ale from hop tail, from inns, ales, and drinking custoins of Old England by Frederick IV. Hackivood, Green the historian in his conquest of England says, the names of the towns and villages of Tsira show us in how systematic a way southern Northumbria was parted among its conquerors. Dot. The English population was not displaced, but the lordship of the soil was transferred to the conqueror. The settlers formed a new aristocracy, while the older nobles sank to a lower positon, for throughout Dera the life of an English thane was priced at but half the value of a northern hold. The inference to be drawn from this passage is that the English lords of the soil were replaced by Danish ones, the English settlers remained in possession of their ancient holdings. In the course of time the two races amalgamated, but at the Norman conquest this amalgamation had only been partially effected. In the districts where the Danes settled they formed new villages, in which they lived apart from the general Anglian population. Had they not done so the memory of their settlement could never have been perpetuated by the Danish names given to their homes. Every group of isolated Danish plus names teaches the same fact and there are many such groups. This is the case in the Wirral district of Cheshire, the peninsula between the Mersey and the Dee, where we find such names as Raby, Greaseby, Frankby, Irby, Bansby, Whitby and Shotwick, and in the centre of the district the village called Thingwall. While throughout the rest of the county scarcely a Danish name can be found, and as these names were conferred by the Danish settlers it is impossible not to believe that under analogous conditions the names in other districts were conferred in the same way. Where a new village was planted midway between two older villages, its territory would be carved in varying proportions out of the lands of the earlier settlements. Sometimes certain rights of the older villages were maintained in the territory of which they had been deprived. Thus in a Danish village of Anlaby, the lands whereof were carved out of the adjoining townships of Kirkella C. and Hessel, the respective rectors of these parishes had curiously divided rights to both the great and the small tithes, whilst in the neighbouring instance of the Danish Willoughby, carved out of Kirkella and Cottingham, the rector of Kirkella took all the great tithes, and the rector of Cottingham took all the small tithes. This method of Danish village formation explains a curious point. The foundation of the earlier Anglian settlements preceded the development of the great road system of England, leaving out of consideration the Roman roads and the comparatively few British roads the former of which have relation to nothing but the military needs of that all-conquering people, our existing road system is due to the Anglo-Saxon. Our old roads lead from one village to another and each village is a centre from which roads radiate. The Danish villages were, on the contrary, usually roadside settlements. New settlements were formed on the vast fringes of wood and waste which surrounded the cultivated lands of the older English villages. The road existed and the one village street was formed along the line. Such wayside settlements are Carnaby and Bessingby, on the road from Bridlington to Driffield. When, as was sometimes the case, the new settlement was planted at a little distance from the existing road a new road running at right angles from the old one and leading directly to the settlement was formed. Skidby, Tothorpe, Kirby, Grindelbith and many others are cases in point. One consequence of such conditions of formation would be that where the Anguish settlements were most numerous the Danish settlements would be few and small because there was less land available in such districts for their formation. While, on the other hand, where English settlements were more sparsely scattered the Danish settlements would be more numerous, and comparatively large. Taking a large district like the East Riding, 
the average area of the Danish townships may be expected to fall below that of the Anglo-Saxon. The facts comply with all these tests. Thus to take the townships with Danish names, and compare with similar districts of Anglo-Saxon names, we arrive at the conclusion as to whether the district was thickly populated before the coming of the Danes. Many Anglo-Saxon villages are to be found along the course of the Roman road, which coincides with the modern one of today. The two classes of population found only in Danish districts, the Sokmani and the Libertenants, are wholly absent in purely English districts. Both held land exempt from villain services, which was a condition of tenure introduced by the Danes. This fact shatters the theory of Green that English settlers were communities of freemen. They were in fact communities of bondmen, villains, borders, cotters, and serfs, the last holding no lands, but being bound to the soil as chattels, and the rest holding their lands, apostrophe at the will of the Lord, and in return for actual services. What then was the Sokman? The lawyer of today will answer, he is one who held land by Sockage, tenure. Although in Doomsday this Sokman is confined to Danish districts, a fact which is recognized in the laws of Edward the Confessor. After the conquest a type of tenure more or less closely corresponding to that by which the earlier Sokman held his land, was gradually established over the whole kingdom. Tenants who owned such tenures were called Sokman, and the tenure itself was called Sockage. A distinction was drawn between free Sockage and villain Sockage. The fuller development of the feudal system which followed the conquest greatly complicated all questions of land tenure. New conditions of holding superior to that of Sockage were introduced. Thus in the pages of Britain, who always speaks in the person of the king, we read, Sock manries are lands and tenements which are not held by knight's fee, nor by grand surgeantries, but by simple services, as lands enfranchised by us, or our predecessors, out of ancient demesnes. Brockton is more explicit. He defines free sockage as the tenure of a tenement, whereof the service is rendered in money to the chief lords, and nothing whatever is paid. Ad scutum et servitium regis. Sockage, he proceeds, is named from Soak, and hence the tenants who held in Sockage are called Sockmani, since they are entirely occupied in agriculture, and of whom wardship and marriage pertain to the nearest parents in the right of blood. And if in any manner homage is taken thereof, as many times is the case, yet the chief lord has not on this account wardship and marriage, which do not always follow homage. He then goes on to define villain sockage, the essential principle of sockage tenure is rent in lieu of services. It is to this fact no doubt that the vast impetus which was given to the coinage of England soon after the coming of the Danes is largely due. As Mr. Wurzae says, the Danish coiners increased to fifty in number from the reign of Ethelia to Edward the Confessor and the greater number exercised this vocation at York and Lincoln. Thus the Sokmani were found only in the settlements of the people who had created in England a tenure of land free from servile obligations. The manner of fixing these early settlements of land was the same in Ireland, in the East Riding of Yorkshire, and in Lincolnshire. The same custom is still observed by our modern colonists who launch out into the Australian bush. The land was staked out by the settler from the highest ridge downwards to the creek of the river or shore. By this means the settler obtained an outlet to the open sea. The homestead was built by the bond or husbandman, on the sheltered ground between the marsh and hill. These settlements became buys, and were encircled by a garth or farmyard. The names of some Norse farms and settlements became composed of a Norse prefix and Saxon ending. Thus we find Oxton the farm of the yoke, in the hollow of a long ridge. Storetten, from Stortan or Big Field. Many of these names are repetitions of places which exist in Cumberland, Denmark, and the Isle of Man. Raby and Irby were smaller farms on the boundary of large buys 
and word arrived from the Danish chief Ivar. Each homestead had its pastures and woods. W. Hikar denoted by the terminals well, wall, and Burkitt, found in such names as Crab Wall, Thalwall, Thing Wall. Thwaite saw hither were sloping pastures, cleared of wood, between the hill and marsh, used for grazing cattle and sheep. This system of agriculture is of Norse origin, and many such Thwaites are to be found in Wallace, Lancashire, and the Lake District. Called Af and Calder, recorded in Doomsday, Calders, derived from Kolfgard, are names existing in Calderstones, at Wavertree, and called a neo in the mere, as well as at East Ham and in Scotland. Each large settler had summer pastures for cattle on the highland or moor, called Soetas or Setter, a shelter seat for the dairy mates. From this custom we derive the names Seacum, Satathwaite, Seathwaite, Seascale, and Selafikled. As the population increased, the larger states were divided among the families of the early settlers and these upland pastures became separate farms. Evidence that these early Norsemen were Christians is found in the name Preston, in Doomsday. Prestun, the farm of the priest, who in these early days farmed his own land. From its position this farm became known as West Kirby. The stone crosses of Nelson and Bromber prove that these churches were founded early in the 11th century. The Danish character of Chester at this date is shown by the fact that it was ruled by lawmen slash in the same manner as the five boroughs, vide rounds feudal England slash p. 465, and its growing wealth and importance was due to the trading intercourse through the Danish ships with Dublin. Coming from the northeast another Norse and Danish settlement sprang up round Liverpool. Though we have no distinct historical record, the place names indicate the centre was at Thalwall, Dingwall. Such names are Roby, West Derby, Kirby, Crosby, Formby, Kirkdale, Toxteth, found in Doomsday as Stockistad, Croxteth, Childwall, Harbreck, Ravensmeols, Ormskirk, Altcar, Burskor Oof, Skelmersdale. Out of 45 names of places recorded in Doomsday in West Derby 110 are Scandinavian, the rest might be interpreted in either dialect. All other names in Doomsday in South Lancashire are Anglo-Saxon, which only amount to 12, the reason for the small number of names being that the land was for the most part lying waste and was thus free from assessment. Thus we find on the present map that Norse names form a large number which are not recorded in Doomsday. Many of these would be later settlements. In West Derby the names of three landowners appear in this survey with Norse names, while three others are probably Norse and seven Saxon. Following the fall of the Danish dynasty the districts of South Lancashire formed part of Cheshire and we find the names of six drengs around Warrington, possessing Norman names, while only one bears a Norse name. The word dreng being Norse, would infer that the tenure was of Danelaw origin and not of Anglo-Saxon. The founder of the Abbey of Burton on Trent, Walfric Spot held great tracts of land in Wirral and W. East Lancashire, which are named in his will dated 1002. Thus the bond here held his land under Merson rules, from which the hides and hundreds were similar to those of the previous Stain law. Lancashire was the southern portion of Dera, which was one of the two kingdoms, Burnisher being the other, into which the conquests of Ida, king of Northumbria were on his death divided. In 559 AD, Ida died, and Ella became king of Deira, and afterwards sole king of Northumbria, until 587 or 589. In 617, Edwin son of Ella was king of Northumbria, the greatest prince, says Hume the historian, of the Heptarchy in that age. He was slain in battle with Pender of Mercia. In 634 the kingdom was again divided, Eanfrid reigning in Bernicia, and Osric in Deira. Then Oswald, saint as well as king, 
appears to have reunited the two provinces again under his kingship of Northumberland. Authorities, in more than one instance, vary as to the exact dates. Within a year or two, the Saxon kingdom of Northumbria reached from the Humber to the Forth, and from the North Sea to the Irish Sea. For two centuries after the death of Ecgfrith the Saxon king and the Battle of Nectensmere, history only records a succession of plunder and pestilence. Green the historian says king after king was swept away by treason and revolt, the country fell into the hands of its turbulent nobles, its very fields lay waste, and the land was scourged by famine and plague. The pirate Northmen or Vikings as they were called first began to raid the coast of England with their fleets with the object of plunder. The English Chronicle records their first attacks in the year 787. Three of their ships landed on the western shores. These were the first ships of Danish men that sought the land of Inglefolk. The monastery of Lindisfarne was plundered six years later by their pirate ships, and the coast of Northumbria was ravaged. January. 793. The following year they returned and destroyed the monasteries of Wearmouth and Jarrow. This was the beginning of the Norse raids on our eastern shores. In 815 Halfton returned from his campaign against Alfred and the year after he divided the lands of Northumbria amongst his followers. In many parts we find groups of Scandinavian plus names so close and thick says Mr. W. G. K. U. Ingwood in his Scandinavian Britain, that we must assume either depopulation by war, or the nearly complete absence of previous population. There is no reason to suppose that the earlier Vikings depopulated the country they ravaged. Spoil was their object and slaughter an incident, as Canon Atkinson has shown in his analysis of the area of Cleveland under cultivation at Doomsday Period. Very little of the country in that district was other than moor or forest at the end of the 11th century, and that most of the villages then existing had Scandinavian names. His conclusion is that these districts were a wilderness since Roman and prehistoric days, and first penetrated by the Danes and Norse, except for some clearings such as Crathorn, Stokesley, Stainton, and Easington, and the old monastery at Whitby. This conclusion receives support, says Mr. Collingwood, from an analysis of the sculptured stones now to be seen in the old churches and sites of Cleveland. It is only at Yarm, Crathorn, Stainton, Easington, and Whitby, that we find monuments of the pre-Viking age, and these are the products of the latest Anglian period. At Osmotherley, Ingleby, Arncliffe, Welbury, Kirkalivington, Thornaby, Ormsby, Skelton, Great Ayton, Kirkdale, and Kirby in Cleveland are tombstones of the 10th and 11th centuries. It is thus evident that the Angles were only beginning to penetrate these northern parts of Yorkshire when the Vikings invaded and carried on the work of land settlement much further. Further extension was made by the Norse from the west coast. As the place names show, monuments of pre-Viking artwork exist at places with Scandinavian names, such as Kirby Moorside, Kirby Mispeton, and Kirkdale, while in other cases only Viking Age crosses are found at places with names of Anglian origin, such as Elleburn, Levisham, Sinnington, Nonnington. This would indicate that some Anglian sites were depopulated and refounded with Danish names, while others had no importance in Anglian times but soon became flourishing sites under the Danes. In the west of Yorkshire the Great Dales were already tenanted by the Angles, but the moors between them, and the sites higher up the valleys, were not the sites of churches until the Danish period. See Anglian and Anglo-Danish Sculptor in the North Riding, by W. G. Collingwood. York's Arch, Journal, 1907. Yorkshire at the time of the Doomsday Survey was caricated and divided into ridings and waypentakes. Thingwall, near Whitby. Canon Atkinson, site lost. Thinghow, near Ginsborough, now lost, and Thinghow. Now Finney Hill, near Northallerton. Mr. William Brown, 
FSA, Tingley, near Wakefield, Thingwall, near Liverpool, Thingwall in Wirral, may have been Thingsteads, W. G. Coyu Ingwood, names of places ending in erg, and Arcadary farms from Setter and Setter, names with Ulsa's prefix, such as Ulfa, Ulscarth, Ulls Water, record the fact that wolves inhabited the hills. Beacons were kept up in olden days on hills which bear the names of Wharton, Walkup, Warwick and Warthol. Danshelf, near Pontefract, is derived from Tadden Esulf. Bloyth and Bloick from Black Egg, Blackwood, Axel, Ackel, Arkel from Zero by One, The Shoulder, The Battle of Brunnen Burii. Was it fought in Lancashire? There is one entry in the Anglo Saxon Chronicle which must be mentioned here as it throws light upon an archaeological discovery of considerable importance. In 911, the Chronicle records that the Danish army among the Northumbrians broke the peace and overran the land of Mercia. When the king learned that they were gone out to plunder, he sent his forces after them both of the West Saxons and the Mercians, and they fought against them and put them to flight, and slew many thousands of them. Dot. There is good reason to believe, as Mr. Andrew shows, Brit. Niemis. Jure. I. 9, that the famous Curedale hoard of silver coins, which was found in 1840 in a leaden chest buried near a difficult ford of the Ribble on the river bank about two miles above Preston, represents the treasure chest of this Danish army, overtaken in its retreat to Northumbria at this ford and destroyed, then follows a process of reasoning in support of the above conclusion, based upon the place of minting and the dating of the coins. The bulk of the coins, however, were Danish issued by Danish kings of Northumbria, many of them from York. Besides the Curedale find of 10,000 silver coins and 1,000 ounces of silver there are records given of other Danish finds. From the Victoria County History of Lancashire, Volume L, C Coins, each historian of this important event has claimed a different site in as many parts of England. In Grose's antiquities we find the allied Scotch, Welsh, Irish, and Danes. The North, Umbrian army, under Anlaf were totally defeated, in 938 at Brunnenberg, Bromridge, Brinkburn, in Northumberland, when Constantine, King of the Scots, and six petty princes of Ireland and Wales, with twelve earls were slain. This description is given in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. The honour of claiming the Lancashire site on the River Brun near Burnley, belongs to the late Mr. Thomas Turner Wilkinson, a master of Burnley Grammar School, who claimed it for Saxifield in 1856. We are indebted to Mr. James T. Marquis, a member of the Lancashire and Cheshire Antiquarian Society for the following summary of evidence which he placed before the above society during the winter session of 1989, and which will be found recorded in the transactions of the society. He says, there is overwhelming testimony in favor of the site on the Lancashire Brun. The reasons for claiming this site are simply two. An old writer spells Brinkburn, Brinkerberg and there is an artificial mound proving a fight. Camden gives Brunford, near Brumbridge in Northumberland, as the place where King Athelstan fought a pitched battle against the Danes. This might easily be, but not the battle we refer to. There is no reason given except the word ford. Gibson suggests that it must have been somewhere near the Humber, although he finds a difficulty in carrying Constantine and the little king of Cumberland so high into Yorkshire. The other places suggested are Brumbera in Cheshire, Banbury in Oxfordshire, Burnham and Bourne in Lincolnshire, Brunton in Northumberland, but no good reason beyond a name, and an embankment in some cases, but not all. Brownage in Lancashire has been suggested, with excellent reasons. Dr. Giles and others suggest that the name should be Brumby instead of Brunnenberg. Ingram in his map of Saxon England places the site in Lincolnshire, near the Trent, 
but without assigning good reasons. Turner observes that the Villa mentions a Brunton in Northumberland, and Gibson states what may still be seen in maps of a century old, that in Cheshire there is a place called Bromber near the shores of the Mersey. This last would be a serious competitor if there was a river Brun, or tumuli, or fort, or battlefield. But nothing is claimed, only the name suggested. Brunsford or Brunford. Let us first establish the site of the Burg, which is a hill that shields or protects a camp, town, or hamlet. The question is, where was the town or village on the Brun? It was in Saxon times usual for the folk to settle near a bear for the protection afforded by an overlord who occupied it. It was also the custom of the early missionaries to establish a fell decoc by setting up a cross near to the hamlet where they used to preach Christianity and bury their dead. Tradition says it was intended to build the church on the site of the cross, but that God willed it otherwise, Godly Lane would be the lane which led from the village in Saxon times to Godsley or Godly, on which was the new church and burial ground. Thus the new town would take its modern name from the ground on which the church stood, namely Brunley, Brunley, and Burnley. The cross built in Saxon times to mark the spot where Christianity was first preached, stood at the foot of the bear near the Brun, and thus the early name would be Brunford. The records of Doomsday Book contain no mention of Burnley. To the east and west would be the vast forest of Boulsworth and Pendle, while the valleys would be marshes and swamps. The ancient roads went along the hillsides and there is an ancient road from Clithero by Pendle passing along the east side of the hill, now almost obliterated, leading to Barrowford. The ancient road on this east side of the valley, was on the Boulsworth slope from Brunford, via Haggate and Shellfield, to Castercliff, Colne, and Drawden which gave its name to the forest, and Emmet. Dr. Whitaker tells us that in his day, in the fields about Red Lees are many strange inequalities in the ground, something like obscure appearances of foundations, or perhaps entrenchments, which the leveling operations of agriculture have not been able to efface. Below Walshaw is a dyke stretching across from Scrow to Darkwood. The 9th century analyst says, the Northmen protected themselves according to custom, with wood and a heap of earth. A wall shore would therefore be a wall of wood. Nothing was safer, when attacked by bowmen, than a wood. Such was the Brunberg. This burr had red leaves with mounds and ditches, in a half circle on each side of the causeway, would have the same appearance on being approached from the east and southeast as the 11th century burr had Lawton Enlam more than in Yorkshire. The ancient way referred to in Dr. Whitaker. From Burnley to Townley, would be from there. Market Cross, along Godley Lane to the Brunford Cross, up over the ridge to the top of Brunshaw, along the causeway to Lodge Farm, through the Deer Park, through the Watch Gate at the foot of the hill, and up to Castle Hill at Tunley. Although Igbert was called the first King of England, his son Alfred the Great at the height of his power only signed himself Alfred of the West Saxons, King. England was still governed under the three provinces at the time of Henry L, namely Wessex, Mercia, and Danela. The latter province comprised the whole tract of country north and east of Watling Street. Mercia included the lands north of the Mersey. Danish Northumbria or Syra comprised the lands to the west of the Pennines. Amongst the hills north of the Ribble the hostile nations could meet in security. Saxon Mercia north of the Mersey, surrounded by alien nations, and having been itself conquered from that claimed as the Danelaw, would be the most likely where those nations could meet in time of peace, and was the debatable land in time of war. After the death of Alfred, when Edward the Elder claimed overlordship, the Danes rose in revolt in the north. It is recorded that he and his warrior sister the Lady of the Mersons abandoned the older strategy of rapine and raid, for that of siege and fortress building, or the making and strengthening of birth. Edward seems to have recovered the land between the Mersey and the Ribble, 
for soon after leaving Manchester, the Britons of Strathclyde, the King of Scots, Reginald of Bamborough who had taken York at this period, and the Danish and Northumbrians take him to be father and lord. The place is not mentioned, but must be somewhere between Boulsworth and Pendle. The same thing happened when Athelstan claimed his overlordship. Profiting by following his father's example, he would travel from Burr to Burr, and his route would not be difficult to trace, namely, Thalwall, Manchester, Buckup, Broad Dyke, Long Dyke, Easton Fort, Copynook, Castle Hill, Watchgate, Brunburg, Broadbank, Castercliffe, Shelffield, Winewall, Amot. The Anglo Saxon Chronicle says that AD 926, Sithric perished, and King Athelstan ruled all the kings in the island. The Northumbrians, Constantine, King of Scots, Ealdred of Bamborough, and others, which they confirmed by pledges and oaths at a place Amot on the 4th of the Ides of July, and they renounced idolatry. Everything points to the fact that Brunnenberg gave its name to this battle. This part of the Saxon king's dominions being the one place where all the hostile nations could meet before the attack. There is no other river Brunn in northern Mercia, and the Saxon chronicle says the battle was fought near Brunnenberg. Ethelwood says Brundun, River and Dale. Simeon gives Wendun, Swindon, Malmesbury and Dugilf names Brunnenberg or Brufford. Florence of Worcester near Brunnenberg. Henry of Huntingdon gives Brunsberg, then Gaima has Brunswick, which we have in Worstorn, which is known to be derived from Thston, the town of WRTH. In the Annates Cambrai it is styled the Bellumbrun, the Battles of the Brun. This would explain the many names. William of Malmesbury says that the field was far into England. We have Brownage and Brownside. In addition to all this we have Bishop Sleep, Swindless Lane, Saxifield, Sarxy, Field Dyke. We have also a Rilly, a Redleys, directly opposite to which we have a traditional battlefield and battlestone, also a High Law Hill, and Hoy Law Pastures a number of cairns of stones, a small tumuli, all of which may be said to be near the Hillford Brunberg. Descriptions of battles from the map. From the two ordnance maps, six inch to the mile, one of Brightleaf, and the other of Worstorn, it may be seen that the roads from Slack, near Huddersfield, pass through the Pennine Range, one by the Long Causeway, on the south of the position and on the southern side. Near Stiperndon, is Warcock Hill. From here running north, are a series of ridges, Shedden Edge, Hazel Edge, Hamilton Hill, to the other road from Slack, passing through the hills at Widdop, and immediately on the north side at Thurston is another Warcock Hill. From Warcock Hill to Warcock Hill would stretch the army of Anlaf in their first position. From the north end of the position a road north to Shellfield and Castercliffe by means of which he would be joined by his Welsh allies, from the Ribble, via Portfield, and his Strathclyde and Cumbrian allies from the north. From this end of the position there is a road due west to the Broad Bank, where there is the site of a small camp at Haggad. From here Ranluff would send his Welsh allies, under Radalis, and his shipmen under Rangrai for the night attack on the advancing Saxons as they crossed the Brunford. They fell on them somewhere on the site of Bishop's House estate, but were afterwards beaten back across the estates known as Saxifield. Two days afterwards both sides prepared for the great struggle near the Burg, and Anlaf, taking his cue from his opponent, advanced his left and took possession of the hill near Mirekla, afterwards called High Law, Round Hill, and the pastures behind still known as Battlefield, with a stone called Battlestone in the center of it. Constantine and the Scots were in charge of the hill, and the Pict, and Orkney men behind. His center he pushed forward at Brown Edge, to the town of WRST, while his right touched Swind and Water under Adelis with the Welsh and shipmen. Two days before the great battle Athelstan, marched out of Brunber at the north end, and encamped somewhere on the plain called Bishop's House Estate. 
is route by the Brunford, and probably Swinless Lane. We are told that Anlef entered the camp as a spy, and ascertaining the position of Athelstan's tent, formed the night attack for the purpose of destroying him. Athelstan, however, leaving for another part of his position on the Brun, gave Worsthan, Bishop of Sherborne, the command. The bishop met his death somewhere on the estate, the pasture being known as Bishop Sleep, which undoubtedly gave its name to the estate. Ada H.S., the Welsh prince, had done this in the night attack, probably coming by way of Walshaw, and Darkwood. Alfgier took up the command, with Tharolf on his right and Iglis in support in front of the W.O. Oud. Alfgier was first assaulted by Adelis with the Welsh and driven off the field, afterwards fleeing the country. Tharolf was assaulted by Rangladane, and soon afterwards by Adelis also, flushed with victory. Tharolf directed his colleague Iglis to assist him, exhorted by his troops to stand close, and if overpowered to retreat to the wood. Tharolf or Tharold the Viking was the hero of this day, near the Netherwood on Thursden Water. He fought his way to Hrun's standard and slew him. His success animated his followers, and Adelis, mourning the death of Hrun, gave way and retreated, with his followers back over Saxeld to the Causeway camp at Broadbank. Whatever took place at Saxophile the enemy left it entirely, and the decisive battle took place at the other end of Brunberg. In walking up Swindeen, by Swindon Water, the district on the right between that river and the Brun is called in old maps Rulli and in older manuscripts Rully, marked in Thomas Turner Wilkinson's time, with a ken and tumulus. Some distance further on we find Heckenhurst. The roads down from the Behar at Truly and at Brownside and at Red Lees by the long causeway leading to Merekla. Athelstan placed Tharolf on the left of his army, at Ruli, to oppose the Welsh and irregular Irish under Adlis. In front of Brownside, Burnside, was Iglis with the picked troops, and on Iglis right opposite were Storm. Athelstan and his Anglo-Saxons, across the original long causeway on the Red. Lees, with the bare entrenchments immediately at his back, was the valiant Turkatul, the Chancellor, with the W ears of Mercia and London opposite Round Hill and Mirekla. Tharolf began by trying to turn the enemy's right flank, but Adler started out from behind the wood, now Hackenhurst, and destroyed Tharolf and his foremost friends on Ruli or Rulli. Iglis came up to assist his brother Viking, and encouraging the retreating troops by an effort destroyed the Welsh Prince Adelis, and drove his troops out of the wood. The memorial of this flight was a cairn and tumulus on Ruli. Athelstan and Anlef were fighting in the centre for the possession of Bruns, Weston, neither making much progress, when the Chancellor Turkitul, with picked men, including the Worcester men under the magnanimous Sin Finn, made a flank attack at Mirekla, and breaking through the defence of the Pict and Orkney men, got to their back O.T.H. Hill. He penetrated to the Cumbrians and Scots, under Constantine, King of the Grandpians. The fight was all round Constantine's son, who was unhorsed. The Chancellor was nearly lost, and the Prince released, when Sin Finn, with a mighty effort, terminated the fight by slaying the prince. On Round Hill, down to one hundred years ago, stood a ken called High Law. When the stones were made use of to mend the roads, a skeleton was found underneath. That would, I believe, be a memorial of the fight. At Back O.T.H. Hill, a BHND road leads through what in an old map, and in tradition is called Battlefield and the first memorial stone is called Battlestone. Another similar stone is further on. Following the blind road through Hurstwood, the Chancellor would find himself at Brown End, near Brown Edge. At the other end of the position, Iglis having won the wood, would be in the neighborhood of Helclough, ready to charge at the same time as Turkitul, on the rear of Anluf's army. At this point of the battle, Athelstan, seeing this, made a successful effort and pushed back the centre. Then began the carnage. 
the memorials of which are still to be seen on Brown Edge, Hamilton Pasture, Swindeen, Twist Hill, Bonfire Hill, and even beyond. Those who could get through the hills at Widdop would do so, others however would take their hordes from the camps at Warcock Hill and other places, and burying their treasures as they went along, pass in front of Boulsworth, and over the moor through Drawden Forest, between Emmet and Wycler. If the Saxon description of the battle, in Turner's history of the Anglo-Saxons be read and compared with the ordnance maps before named, the reader will see that there is no other place in England which can show the same circumstantial evidence nor any place, having that evidence, be other than the place sought for. Dane's house, Burnley, is thus referred to by the late Mr. T. T. Wilkinson, F.R.A.S. Dane's house is now a deserted mansion situated about half a mile to the north of Burnley, on the Colne Road. It has been conjectured there was a residence on the same site AD 937, when Athelstan, King of the South Saxons, overthrew with great slaughter, at the famous Battle of Brunnenberg, Anlath, the Dane, and Constantine, King of the Scots. Tradition states that it was here that Anlaf rested on his way to the battlefield from Dublin and the Isles, hence the name Dane's House. The present deserted mansion has undergone little change since it was re-erected about the year 1500. This house has now been pulled down. The dyke or dykes. Broadclaw, book up. This mighty entrenchment is over 600 yards in length and four over 400 yards of the line is 18 yards broad at the bottom. No satisfactory solution has yet been offered of the cause of this gigantic work or of the use to which it was put originally. Speaking of it Newbing, History of Rossendale, says, the careful investigations of Mr. Wilkinson have invested this singular work with more of interest than had before been associated with it, by his having with marked ability and perseverance, collected together a mass of exhaustive evidence, enforced by a chain of argument the most conclusive, with regard to the much debated locality of the great struggle between the Saxons and the Danes, which he endeavours, and most successfully, to show is to be found in the immediate neighbourhood of Burnley, and in connection with which the earthwork in question constituted, probably, a not unimportant adjunct. Again, he says, if Saxonfield, Saxifield, near Burnley, was the scene of the engagement between the troops of Athelstan and Anlath, then it is in the highest degree probable that one or other of the rival armies, most likely that of the Saxon king, forced, or attempted to force a passage through the valley of the Irwell and that there they were encountered by the confederated hosts entrenched behind the vast earthwork at Broadclaw that commanded the line of their march. Whether this was taken in flank or rear by the Saxon warriors, or whether it was successful in arresting their progress, or delaying a portion of their army, it is impossible to determine, but that it was constructed for weighty strategical purposes, under the belief that its position was of the last importance, so much of the remains of the extraordinary which still exists affords sufficient evidence.